Welcome to Compromising Positions. I'm Leanne Potter, Cyber Anthropologist and Head of Security Operations for a major retailer. And I'm Jeff Watkins, a cybersecurity enthusiast and CTO for a major tech consultancy. Together, we're the tech podcast that asks non cybersecurity professionals what we in the industry can do to make their lives easier and help make our organizations more prepared to face ever changing human centric cyber threats. In this episode, we're joined by Helena Hill, a seasoned UX strategist and consultant and AI expert with a wealth of experience spanning diverse clients from pre startup to global industry giants. In this episode, we explore the fascinating topic of UX and cybersecurity. We're going to learn from UX to see how we can create a better user experience for people on their security journey, learn how to get buy-in from the business about implementing controls such as MFA, and how to sell our value offering as a positive user experience. And of course, crucially, how to take those first few steps to engage with the user experience team. This is the first of our two-part conversation with Helena. Next week, we'll be talking about her other specialism, AI, which kicks off our Christmas mini series all about the subject. We really love this chat and think you will do too. So sit back and enjoy our interview with Helena Hill for this episode. Are you user experienced? Applying the principles of UX and UR to the cybersecurity journey. Welcome to Compromising Positions and another fantastic episode. Today's guest is Helena Hill, a seasoned UX strategist and consultant. She has an absolute wealth of experience spanning lots of diverse clients from pre-startups to global industry giants. She is an incredible thought leader and what I've been very impressed with in following Helena's journey is following her chat GPT delve into that whole world which I'd love to get involved with but it frightens me a little bit so I'm hoping Elena can really help us understand what should we expect from that world now that she is a certified expert. Helena, welcome to the show. Thanks. Please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah thanks so much for having me and thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Yes so as you mentioned um, Helena Hill I've been a UX consultant uh, mainly in the strategy sphere for some number of years now probably more than I'd like to, to imagine and uh, yeah so I work with pre-starts right up through to, as you mentioned, the uh, number of global industries and helping them become more user and customer centric in their everyday business dealings, as it were. So it's a very varied job. I'm very lucky. I get to work on projects that are different every day. I also get to work with digital agencies who bring me in to do some interim or fractional head of UX work. My other hat, uh, as well as being a consultant, is I'm that of a trainer. So I train people wanting to come into the UX profession. And I'm a mentor in UX and digital at Northumbria University. So I work really closely with their enterprise department with students and graduates who are setting up or scaling up their own businesses. So I have a number of hats that I wear. And as you just mentioned there, Leanne, I've just recently in the summer now actually got my uh, chat GPT certification, which has certainly been a very interesting string to my bow to have. And I kind of, I will maybe talk a little bit why I did that and what the relationship is between I think, large language models and uh, user and customer experience later on. So uh, thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to, to chatting with you both this afternoon. Mm, wow, that's, that is so many hats. Surprisingly, your head doesn't get hot. There's so oh, it many does, of them. regularly. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one thing I remember from my childhood is a song, You, You, Van Magu, Custard, Dribble, Pow. Lots of U's in user experience, user interface, yeah. user research. For our, the benefits of our listeners who might just see them all as just a big bunch of views, what is the difference between all of them and what are they? Well, there is a huge difference, actually. And I think I think as we were just chatting about before the, the podcast recording this afternoon, you know, that there is, I think, a misconception about what user experience is and also what those different disciplines within user experience are. And of course, if I'm looking strategically at a, a user experience roadmap or how, along with my client, we can plug in a UX roadmap into their sort of product design process, is that there has to be an understanding of what it is that happens when. So user experience is, in essence, it's about how people feel, you know, when they are using a digital or a physical asset or product. It, it's not just about digital. That's, that's something that I want to talk about. It's about um, how somebody feels when they using the not just their iPhone for example but actually the the item itself the physical item it's also about space physical space and how people feel when they move through physical space so experience is really about emotion and it's about making people feel happy it's about making people feel good it's about removing friction it's about 
removing frustration in journeys. Usability is another another term that's used quite often but comes under the under experience, the user experience umbrella and usability is about ease of use. For example, I use Amazon regularly. I find it easy to use. I know where to go to get my previous orders. I know where to go to buy again. It's easy to use in terms of usability. Is it enjoyable to use? No, I don't go on Amazon and get really excited about using the Amazon website, but it is easy to use. And I think that that's the first thing that we need to pick apart is what's the difference actually between usability and user experience. And it's that ease of use versus enjoyability or not of use. So that's the first thing. User research. Well, that's (laughs) what should be done at very, very near the beginning of a UX project. And and what should be researched? Well, I mean, we can talk, you know, I could talk an awful lot about this, but it's the bit that often gets missed out, especially by startups. It's who are our users or who are our customers? Are they different? Because often we have a different customer to an end user. Who are our competitors? So uh, there's been a number of times I've undertaken a competitor research, so a competitor landscape, just to sort of see where this potential product or service might lie in the marketplace. So researching customers, users, competitors. Uh, That's a a very different piece of what I call the exploratory part of a UX process that happens right near the beginning. And we can't have a business or a successful business unless we know who it is that we are selling that product or service to. Um, Unfortunately, 95% of the time, that's the part that gets missed. So, um, I mean, I, I could talk about this an awful lot, but I'll try and keep it to that for now. And I think the last one that you mentioned there, Leanne, was user interface, user interfaces, which is, you know, what's that and what's the difference between user interface and user experience? So the user interface is what we engage with as people, as humans on, for example, a digital interface. So whether it be a website or an app or a uh, dashboard, for example, that's another example of a user interface. So I hope that's answered those questions, kind of picked usability and experience apart. I think that's important important, but also where that research piece comes in as well. I think that distinction is so important because I, mm. I know in business, big and small, it's just used as a catch-all really, isn't it? It is. You know, user experience mm. is used as a big catch-all for, for all that. And, and I think there's just so much more to it. There's, I think there's a misunderstanding, isn't there? I think, I think UX as a discipline is still not understood by the majority of business. It, it isn't. Mm. I think, you know, you still have, we, we, you know, marketing is understood as a division or a department. Sales is understood as a division, as a department. UX isn't understood as, I shouldn't really say this because I don't think it actually should be a department. I think it should be cross-departmental. Mm, mm. It's yeah. not it, It's not um, understood as a discipline within industry. Do you think that's because it's somewhat abstract? Whereas like sales, you sell 100 oranges, you've sold 100 oranges, you plan to sell 1,000 oranges. Mm-hmm. It's quite, and there's a parallel here, bringing it back to, to cybersecurity. Is cybersecurity or is, is also quite an abstract yeah. thing? I mean, people know when there's, an, there's a lack of it, as in you get breached or something, but people don't really understand the purpose of it. Yeah, I agree uh, with both of those things, actually. Uh, and, mm. and again, talking from a UX point of view, I think it is understanding the purpose of it. And when I'm brought in as a consultant to work with an organisation, what the person who brings me in thinks is the issue and what is actually the issue are two quite different things. So it might be that, you know, we need our website sorting out. Let's, let's just take that as a very sort of ballpark, vague, vague proposition. Actually, when you get into an organisation, yes, the website does need improving in X, Y, Z, number of ways, but it often comes back down to organisational design and organisational culture. And I guess in a way, the the understanding that, you know, we have to go out and do this exploratory part to be able to then go on and make those improvements to our website. So a lot of the time is me going in there and and taking that argument or taking our case as UXs to C-suite, for example, and saying, you know, this is why we need to do these things. And sometimes it's not a case of calling it user experience at all. It's calling it user research or customer research. We need to understand more about them before we can improve X. And so, yes, you're right. And I can, I can imagine that cybersecurity, you often come across 
similar challenges in terms of buying. Mm. In theory, everybody's a user of security, but we also have the anti-users as well. And there's, I guess there's extensive research in, in that area. And it's difficult because you can't really research an, an attacker. Not not directly. People in general aren't going to give you much of, a, of an interview if they're if they're on the bad side of the coin. But that's something from a, things like from a persona point of view, we've been thinking, you know, there's personas. Mm -hmm. And, and in security, we have persona non grata. Right. They're, they're, they're the anti-users. Anti they're the bad users. Yeah. So, so actually, there's a crossover. There is. And, and I've done that before on several occasions. These are the type of people who we don't want. Yeah. So creating sort of anti-personas, I think, I mean, I think that there's almost as valuable, if not as valuable, as creating a set of personas, actually. You know, these are the people who don't fit our ideal customer. And I think it's a great, it's a great um, activity to go through, especially like in a workshop, you know, within an organization. Let's dive into that a bit more then. How would you go about creating a session for an anti-user? Ah, right. Well, usually it's starting with what do we know about our customers? What do we actually know mm. about who is using our product or service? And of course, that varies greatly. So, and we have to start there, actually. If we don't know anything about our customers, which is most of the time, um, more than you would think, even in some of these larger organizations that I've worked with. So starting with that, it says, who do we think our customers are? And it's usually starting with a set of assumptions. We think our customers are these types of people. Now, once we've come up with an, a set of assumptive personas, uh, we can then go out and validate those with user research. And I feel that's the time that you can also go out and validate who your customers aren't. So those anti-personas. There are a number of ways that we can get that kind of qualitative data that we need to build those two types of personas. You know, whether it be surveys, customer surveys, whether it be focus groups, whether it be user diaries, there's many ways in which we can use that type of qualitative data to identify who are our customers and who aren't our customers. I use a tool called empathy mapping regularly, which is a kind of that next step up. And that really, really can help us identify who they are and who they aren't. Because that empathy mapping stage is where we get into the shoes or under the skin, which is not a particularly nice phase, is it? But under the skin of, of the user, what are these people influenced by? Who do they hear talking? What do they say on a daily basis? What do they read? What do they, you know, websites do they look at? And I think that helps us build up an idea of, well, who are they and who are they not? So I think it, it's not quite as binary as that. And obviously there are going to be gray areas in the middle, but it gives us something which is more than 95% of my clients start with. We were talking earlier on about it's kind of a maybe discussed at the very beginning like a, a misunderstood field and maybe not as invested as much as some other departments mm -hmm. and there are and i'd say there's parallels with cybersecurity there often one of the smallest departments in an organization i think leanne i think your figure is something like was it one cybersecurity person for every hundred developers or some outrageous number and it, it's also misunderstood people think are you doing passwords are you doing firewalls and it's, it's it's not just that how do you sell it to the board yeah it's i think it's a it's a really difficult one and it sounds like that cybersecurity has that similar challenge as we do in ux and i've done this a number of times as approach where particularly when there's one person person that is labeled as the UX person. And like you mentioned there, you know, one cybersecurity for 100 developers, uh, usually that will be the case with UX as well, if that. So, you know, how can we go about trying to change that situation in order to educate the business as a whole about what cybersecurity or the importance of cybersecurity and user experience are. There's a couple of ways that I've approached this in the past. And one is to is to sort of bring together a group of people from both cross-departmental, but very importantly, not just cross-departmentally, but also from cross-hierarchically as well. So if we can get a decision maker in the room to somebody who's answering telephones, for example, or customer service agent, if we can get that cross and that sort of vertical hierarchy of people in the room and produce a set of what I would call champions or advocates who then mm -hmm. come together to learn about UX or cybersecurity and then take what they've learned and spread the word throughout their departments. And that has really worked for me, you know, and we, we kind of meet together every two to three weeks, for example, or I'll go into their office or we'll chat, chat together, uh, you know, virtually or whatever it is. We'll then talk about it, what stage they're at, and then we'll go out and we spread the word about what it is we're doing. And that has 
been quite successful, not always, but quite successful and has certainly led to getting more buy-in from different departments because it is it is difficult and I, I, I understand that. So uh, I think you, people who are, you know, working at all levels and across all departments, if, if we can get them in to a room and talk to them and educate them and say, well, actually, if we start doing this as an organisation, it's going to benefit all of us, not just our external users, but also you as an employee of this company. So I don't know if that's something that you've ever come across or you've tried within your organization. Silos are an interesting oh, organizational feature, aren't yes. they? And we had a fascinating discussion around the concept of super connectors mm-hmm. and Dunbar's number and like are silos a necessary evil in, in life or is there a better way of going about your business? And yeah. I think people know that silos aren't conducive to effective collaboration. Mm-hmm. They might help on the micro level, you know, inside your silo might be great. I think large organizations really, um, it's interesting to see the different uh, areas of things like the NHS and how some of their programs seem to be very, very similar, but they're not talking to each other. No, no. I guess, uh, do you have any other yeah. tips on how to break down organizational silos? Yeah, it, it, it's it's a tough one, isn't it? And um, I think sometimes, depending on the organization, you're banging your head against a brick wall. You know, and I, I, I can think of one particular client I've worked with who, you know, over the past five years, actually, who I've worked with and then and then mentored and is still coming across that problem is, is people, that willingness to kind of step outside a comfort zone, if you will, and... I guess, bring in new ideas and it's opening Mm -hmm. that. Uh, What I quite like the idea of is sort of this, that UX and and cybersecurity as well become part of that agile process where it's, we we have, you know, a leader, but but then also people who are underneath that, but but, but cross-departmentally who can go back and, and work with their teams and educate them. I do think it comes back to education. I probably will say that as an ex-teacher, but I really do believe that. I think it's it's banging that door until you can actually show what the results are. So I suppose my answer to that is, from a UX point of view, it's plugging into what the organisational goals and objectives are and saying, you want to achieve this, this is how UX in this context can enable you to get from A to B. And I'm guessing it might be the same for you. Mm, The little part to this is, I don't know if this is the same with you, but certainly cybersecurity, people just see it as like, this is tech, not interested. Mm -hmm. It almost is like there's there's bits of the business that are like, well, this is tech, we're not interested. Do people consider UX to be part of tech as well? Yes, very much so. I, I think so. I think it is seen as part of tech, I think. But again, I think that brings us back to that misunderstanding of the discipline that we were talking about at the beginning. I think some people do see it as part of tech. I think some people still see it as graphic design. And it's actually neither. It crosses both of those and encompasses both of those, but it isn't either one of them. I think that brings us back to that education part. It feels like you could end up in the situation where there's the business going, oh, you're you're in tech, we're not interested. And then the people in tech going, oh, you're not in tech, we're not interested. And kind Mm -hmm. of having to build a lot of bridges between various areas. Yes. Yes, definitely. And I think that's why we still still have, even in much larger organisations, you know, organisations with thousands of employees, only one or two people working with that UX hat on because there is that misunderstanding. People don't understand the value to business. And I try and bang that drum. I'm, I'm not I'm, a, I'm a not a UX designer. I'm a UX strategist. There are people out there who are way better at designing user interfaces than I am. What I'm interested in is understanding, is get, oh, getting those people in decision-making positions, those people who, the pers- who hold the purse strings, understanding how UX as a discipline can help them get from A to B. Now, with it, a might be, for example, well, you know what, we've got an NPS score at the minute of seven, we need to get that up to 10 or whatever it might be, or 70 by in three months time. Okay, well, there's a number of ways using user research, doing some A-B testing, for example, redesigning the website, redesigning the user interfaces, for example, there's a number of different tools that we can bring in that will enable you to increase your NPS score tenfold. Um, And it's understanding. I think when you start talking to those people in a language that they understand, which is impact, 
and KPIs and numbers and percentages, that's when it's the message starts to get through. So we have to have a business head. It's not all pretty pictures. This is about making a real difference to your organization. When I think of user experience teams um, and that whole discipline, I always think about the ability to ask the right questions at the right time and understanding where we are, where we're not, Mm -hmm. where we need to improve, what the actual problem is, just like you alluded to there, because often isn't what we initially think. One of the podcasts we did, um, someone said, uh, you know, we design things for how we'd like people to behave rather than how they actually behave. And I think that's very apt, particularly in cybersecurity, when it's quite, don't don't go here, don't click on this, because uh, we don't want you to. As soon as you put a fence around something, someone always wants to vault over it. So <laughs> what do you think are the, some of the questions we could ask? If we were starting to think like a user experience team to give people a better user experience when engaging, when engaging with the cybersecurity profession, but also the controls we put in place, what are the questions we need to start asking and how do we frame that so we can get the best answers out of that? So if, are you talking sort of between UX and cybersecurity teams? Let's do two scenarios. Okay. One scenario, we actually have a user experience team in-house. Mm-hmm. And then the other scenario, we don't. So these poor cybersecurity people are trying to, who listen to this podcast go, I'm going to try that tomorrow. What should, what should they first try out? <laughs> well, I think I think if we start with that, there's no, there's no UX team in-house, because I'm going to be perfectly yeah. honest and say that's probably the most likely. Okay. That there will be no or very little. And that very little probably doesn't have much in experience in the way of cybersecurity as I don't either and I put my hands up to that I don't have mm-hmm. much of any experience in cybersecurity but I think what this presents us with is an absolutely fabulous experience potentially to have here between cyber and UX working together to create not only a usable cybersecurity experience one that doesn't frustrate I'm not going to say enjoyable because I don't think necessarily I, think- I, I, I can't promise enjoyable <laughs> cybersecurity I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm no, not gonna promise anyone that. Yeah, so that that's, I guess it brings us back to that usability versus experience that we talked about at the beginning. But I think there's an incredible opportunity here to for cyber people working in cybersecurity, particularly when there isn't a UX function within an organization to do some UX type research, actually. Um, and I think there's, there's a number of ways we can do that, including some of the tools that I talked about earlier on. So A-B testing. So, I mean, there's a number of different ways. I mean, I think about the, the ways that I interact with security when I'm doing sort of everyday online things. So, I mean, I think about, you know, 2FA. I think about, you know, biometric authentication. When I'm using something like my iPhone, I think about, you know, Am I putting in a username and a password? Am I given security questions? Am I given a capture? And I think there's a real opportunity there to test how a user feels when using or what the level of security is that they would expect when using different apps or websites. And so, for example, when I'm using my banking app, I would fully expect to have to answer, and I do, to that that user journey to include two or three different security questions. So for example, I have an account for my business where I use a, we use an app. I can biometrically log into that app only for a number of times before I then have to use a passcode. So it will only now need to do that. I noticed that if I'm uh, logging into my accounting software, then I have to use an authenticator and that authenticator will, you know, give me that six number code in order to log in. So this is where I think the the opportunity for cybersecurity colleagues lies in, I think there's an expectation and understanding what that expectation is from users or clients or customers, whatever it looks like within their, that, that context, what they expect the level of security should be. Because my assumption would be, that for a banking app, that users would say, yes, I, I want to ensure that there is mm. there are a number of steps that I have to go through to authenticate myself as being that customer. But at the same time, I don't want those steps to get in the way of my experience. And so that research part that we were talking about earlier on, it's so very important at that point, before we start developing something and maybe even thinking about what those security steps are, understanding what the user expects. Now, I would expect a much higher level of security from my banking app than I would from 
using an e-commerce website, for example. I notice if I'm using a, you know, a general e-commerce store to buy something, I will be sent, you know, through my credit card, a a six number code again to to put in there to input. I don't want that to be onerous, but at the same time, I want that to be safe. So mm. so it, it, it's bringing those UX principles of ease of use and embedding them into that cybersecurity journey. And I think there's a real opportunity there to bring those two things together and and really exploit them in a great way for the user. I don't know if that's mm. a question or not. Yeah, that's that's really, really interesting. And I think it's in line with what we've sort of been chatting about before. There's that kind of almost like a quadrant self, like the, the level of trust instilled mm-hmm. in a particular control and the convenience of access. And yes. also the timeliness as well. If you had to put a six digit code that's sent into your SMS, you know, to your, to your phone to just look at the products, you'd be going, well, this, this doesn't, this isn't a good convenient solution. And then it didn't ask you when you're paying me, like, oh, I'm yes. confused by this. But, but now we kind of, we do expect from a trust point of view mm-hmm. and feel much better about an SMS code coming through when you're about to pay. Yes. Very much so. And I don't think, and, and, and some of those, some of them will actually allow you to, I mean, I know I use sort of Chrome as a browser, you know, it'll allow you to sort of you know, from, you know, copy from text message. So actually there, there are ways in which I don't have to keep looking between two devices mm. to see what that code is and then go, well, okay, I need to input that. I can copy if I'm using my mobile device, which I most often do, as do many people in the evenings, if they're browsing or, or, or whatever, you know, to think about device types as well. It's a whole different conversation, you know, is, is I, mm-hmm. you know, my security is kept i'm safe but i'm a, a, my user experience is easier or my usability is easier because i can copy something straight from from that into the browser so it's a it's an interesting coming together of the two there isn't it it does make me think if we just took the time to ask our customers what they wanted when it comes to security the potential to actually innovate in this space around things like passwords mm-hmm. uh, and security could be huge. So there's a conversation I've, I've had a, a few times with organizations I've worked with, and it's around them turning down a certain security control saying, our users will hate it. And I was like, have you asked them? Probably. Have you done any user, have you done any user research on that? No, no, we're not doing any user research, but we just know. Mm. And how do I fight against that question? Now, in, in this instance, it was for a financial institution, but not a bank. And I was saying, let's introduce 2FA as an option, not as mandatory, so that people have the option if they want to use it, they can do. And those that do use it, obviously, they'll be a lot safer and that'll that'll cut down our threat landscape quite a lot if we can encourage them to use it. But the conversation I had was like, nah, users won't go for that. I try to frame it in the fact that users in general were getting used to using things like 2FA because of banking. And so there might be an appetite there to leverage that. You know, that that experience is something they're used to now. I can understand like 10 years ago when nobody used 2FA mm-hmm. that people would be like, oh, not introducing that. But do you think there's something about getting buy-in, but also as individuals get used to new technologies, new processes, that their expectation for things like 2FA becomes a lot more palatable? Well, the answer to that is yes. But I, I just want to go back to your question around how do we persuade In a way, that's what we want to do, isn't it? How do we persuade? Um, And there's two things that I think will will work for those of you listening who are in cybersecurity. And the first one is look to other industries. So the banking industry, the fintech world, as it were, um, the likes of Curve, there's a number of other, isn't there, quite recent sort of online banking uh, apps are really very successful and part of the reason for that success not wholly but part of the reason for their success is they've looked to other industries for user experiences and user journeys so one of the reasons that one of those has been which I can't remember the name of quite yet um it'll come back to me has been so successful is they looked at e-commerce journeys and built a similar journey into their application so and this is not always to do with fintech of course i found that some of my clients those ones who've been open to looking at how other industries so not competitors but other industries do things or create great user experiences how can we take that user journey or the steps in that experience and apply it to our user journey and our experiences uh, and i think there's a huge amount to be learned there so i think that's one way of doing it and the other one is what i mentioned before is numbers show them the difference if we any kind of testing always always collect data collect that quantitative data to show 
for example, how many completions of a task there are using 2FA Mm -hmm. versus not using 2FA and collect qualitative data saying, well, this is how I felt when I was using this Mm -hmm. and this is how I felt when I was using that journey. So, for example, not using 2FA, well, actually, I found it easier to use because there was less steps, but actually, I felt like my data was less safe. So it's bringing together that quantitative data. This is actually how many people preferred the 2FA process, not because of the extra step in the user journey, but because they felt safer and vice versa. And if you can go to those decision makers with that kind of data and say, I know you've assumed that your customers or clients want this, but this is actually the real deal. This is straight from your customer's mouth. This is what they really want. And this is how they say they feel. And those two things together can be a bit of a game changer. Oh, absolutely. I think what it highlights there is, you know, let's just assume that use case is correct. I know even as a civilian interacting with the world, using online banking and, and you know, using e-commerce and things like that, I do care about my data, you know, even when I haven't got my cybersecurity hat on. But the, there's sometimes that assumption is that more steps equals less likelihood to completion. But there, there is a whole piece around not just I need to get this task done quickly, mm-hmm. but what is the outcome of me? engaging with this task and then as you touched on there is knowing that no matter what I do on this app I feel safe yeah I think that is so it's such an underappreciative element of joy we can bring to our customers it is and I think that's where we have to strike that balance don't we between the two both are incredibly important user experience for keeping customers for example uh, because nobody wants to lose customers or users because a journey has been so difficult to complete but at the same time we we have to create a journey that does include a number in in let's say for example in a banking app that does include a number of steps but i think that's where that's where it brings us back to that research piece doesn't it it brings us back to that strategy piece what is it that we need to know before we can start building this thing and we have to speak to our customers or our clients or we have to we have to say to them what is it what is the level of security if we're talking just specifically about security at the moment what is this level of security you would expect when using an e-commerce website when using a website a brochure website when using your banking app what would you expect and then testing those, you know, and giving customers a number of options to see, you know, what is it that they felt gave that balance of experience and trustworthiness and safety. Mm. Those things should be things that companies should be striving for because there's, there's so many times in my own sort of user journey, if I've gone to a website and it looks suspect, you know, it looks like a spammy, awful website i'm not going to put my card details in there no it's like you wouldn't if i don't see a padlock Mm. in a browser bar i won't put i won't put my details in there you know all you need to click on do is click on that and it says not secure Mm. which is which is um a really nice user experience tool that that Mm. google have done there that little pre-warning like you you've got the choice so again it's it's almost like like nudge fear isn't it where you've got a choice you're a nudge architect you can still go to that website you're risking things you can do i'm giving you a little gentle nudge saying don't go there. <laughs> yeah, your card details may not be safe. You know, there, there, there mm. is a there is there is a that it kind of planting, isn't it? That doubt. I know, as you do, when we, we work in this in this industry, that what that padlock means. You know, it means that it's got an SSL certificate. As as you'll know much better than I am, that's not a, a catch all, but it certainly helps in terms of mm. trustworthiness of a website. There's a lot to be said for simplicity in the message as well and test, testing out i don't know how much you get involved in like testing actual messages because i've seen things in the past where like i'm not sure i'm not clear how to proceed or these instructions are complex or this is putting the fear of god in me when it didn't need to mm-hmm. yes absolutely I mean, and i think you know we, we're kind of sort of moving over to content aren't we and sort of content creation and content design and and messaging uh, and i think yeah exactly mm-hmm. when you're you're dealing with security and the types of industries that require this level of security then yeah i think i think messaging and content design within that experience and in the marketing that surrounds it as well is absolutely key mm. you've got a cybersecurity team that really should be thinking about the user experience how um, should 
the team engage with the UX team? And, and how would they go about it? Bring, bring us on board. <laughs> First of all, reach out. Reach out to, to UXs. Or if there isn't anybody in-house, there isn't a UX. Well, I tried that, actually. And they turned around and so I said, oh, I'd like to have a meeting with you. And, and they said, oh, Leanne, Head of Security Operations. What have I done wrong? Ah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, I, I, was like, oh, Actually, I can see that. What have What have I designed <laughs> that has that's that's letting all this data you know escape? Yeah, no, I can see that. I can see that. But no, re- reach out to me. And I think you know, I'm learning an awful lot as well from this conversation. I, I'm absolutely you know about how actually there, how much scope there is for these two. I don't want to call it them departments because that makes us think of silos, doesn't it? But what are essentially two different disciplines coming together to work together to create a better experience for our customers or our users. So I do understand that initial panic about what have we done wrong, but I think it's this, you know, how can we work together for the greater good, as it were? How can you help us make this journey better? And we always talk to people, talk in UX about talking to our customers and clients in a language that they understand and not using unnecessarily technical jargon, for example. And maybe we could learn the same, actually, you know, within a, an organization as well as actually, you know what, we've got a journey here. We've got a user journey or a customer journey that we'd really like your help with. It's got, there are going to be a series or a number of security steps steps that we need to test and we need to understand about more how our users and customers feel as they're moving through these steps. How about we work together on this project in order to achieve this? That might be a start, but I mean, that's ideal, isn't it? But of course, there's not always somebody in house, which is then why I'm brought in. And I definitely think they should bring you in. I think think you'd have a lot to say about that. I would. (laughs) I think the big thing for me this episode was having the confidence to challenge the argument that users hate NFA, so we shouldn't even think about introducing it. Yeah, I'm sure like Helena said, the degrees of expectation around the levels of security, you don't want to go Fort Knox on accessing BBC weather, for example, but I do think more and more people are becoming accustomed to using things like MFA. Not only accustomed to it, but in some cases, I think people are starting to expect it. Now, I've added a few interesting articles on both sides of the argument in the show notes for our listeners, so they can take a look at that. And I'd really love to actually to hear what our listeners think about this topic. Are people becoming more used to security as part of their user journey? Yeah, we can't wait to hear from you on this. I mean, we're all users of security at the end of the day. Now, next week, we've got Eleanor back and she's going to talk to us about how she uses AI to innovate, generate ideas and spark creativity in what she does. It's also our season end while we take a break over Christmas, but don't worry, while we're off, we've got a few exciting things planned, including a mini episode on AI. I, for one, can't wait for that. Me too. Links to everything Helen discussed in this episode can be found on the show notes if you like the show, please do leave us a review and share on LinkedIn or in your teams. It really helps us spread the word to get high quality guests like Helena on future episodes. We hope you enjoyed this episode. See you next time. Keep secure and don't forget to ask yourself, am I the compromising position here? <laughs>